Hello there and welcome to this series of videos going through the content of A-level maths. Here we're looking at the numerical methods chapter so we can answer questions from exercise 10a. So let's jump into it. So we have a theorem here, it's called the intermediate value theorem and the intermediate value theorem states, um, and it's quite a complicated mathematical statement here, that if our function is a continuous function, that means that it doesn't jump all of a sudden from one part of the graph to another part of the graph. It's just one flowing line. Effectively, you can draw the graph without taking your pencil off the page. Um, in the domain, brackets A to B. Now, what this means here is it means that X is in between two numbers. Um, so it's not like a coordinate, it means that x is in the interval between a and b. So x is a number um, between a and b, and it's continuous throughout that whole part of the graph. Then, now we have an upside down capital A here, this means for all. So then for all d values that exist between f of a and f of b, and this backward capital E symbol means there exists a C inside the interval from A to B such that D equals F of C. Now what on earth does this complicated mathematical statement mean? It's much more easier to visualise this. So there's our continuous function, there's the first part of the sentence. It starts at A, this uh, function here and it has an output value of f of a, so that's where these f of a and f of b come from. They're effectively the y values. Uh, b is the upper bound of this curve, and f of b will be the upper bound of the y function. So then for all d values that are in between f of a to f of b, that's to say that no matter what d value you pick, it could be down here, as long as it's in between f of a and f of b could be here, could be up here, could be here, then no matter where that d value is, there will exist a coordinate such that f of c will give you d as your output. So no matter where you are on this horizontal line here, so in this vertical line here, you can trace back yourself to an x coordinate that will be the input for that output value. Okay, now wh where can we use this in numerical methods? Well, if we have a line, a continuous function, and it crosses over the x-axis, and we have a upper bound of a and a sorry lower bound of a and an upper bound of b, and they go from a negative value to a positive value, it could go the other way around. It could go from negative from positive to negative if it, if it wants to then the d value effectively that we're thinking of here will be the zero coordinate on this axis here. There will be <clears throat> a value c that will be the root of this equation. So the correct term for it is Bolzano's corollary. We don't need to remember that though. Um, if a continuous function has values that are opposite signs in an interval, so one's positive, one's negative, then it must have a root in between this interval from A to B. So effectively the C value here is the root for this equation here, for this function here. A root is when your function equals zero. So F of C here equals zero. That's what it means to be a root. So effectively, because there is a change in sign when we substitute in A and when we substitute in B, somewhere in between that A and B value, there will be a certain value for X, such that when you do substitute it in, you get zero as your output, because zero is a number in between a negative value and a positive value. Right, so let's get stuck into a question then. So the diagram shows a sketch of the curve y equals f of x, where f of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3x plus 1. This is uh, the graph of the function. We've got a couple of questions to answer here using the corollary that we looked at earlier. A corollary, just so you know, is like a baby theorem. It ge generally follows on from a bigger theorem. Uh, explain how your graph shows that there is a root in between 2 and 3. So 2 is here and 3 is here. 
And we can clearly see that if we were to find the value of f of 2, that would be negative, and f of 3 would be positive. So we'd need to write a sentence here. Since the graph crosses over the x-axis between 2 and 3, there must be an interval, there must be a root in this interval. And the f of 2 value is negative, the f of 3 value is positive. So somewhere in between 2 and 3, there must be a value that gives us 0 as our output. The next question here is to show that f of x has a root in between 1.4 to 1.5. So we're going to need to sub in these two values and show that there is a change in sign. So first substituting in f of 1.4. Substitute that straight into your calculator and you get 0 0.0, so it'll be 0 0.104. Substitute in 1.5 into your function and you get minus 0.125. So you can see here it's going from positive to negative, and as long as it goes from one sign to a different sign, then we have a root in between 1.4 to 1.5. But you're going to have to explain that when you write your answer. You're going to have to write a concluding sentence along the lines of, since there is a change of sign, there must be a root in the interval from 1.4 to 1.5. Uh, we can see here the graph is obviously continuous, so you may want to add that in as well. As f of x is continuous and we have seen a change in sign, there must be then a root in between 1.4 to 1.5. That conclusion is worth a whole mark in and of its own. Okay, so make sure you don't miss that. Um, this method is not perfect though. As I said before, the function needs to be continuous. It needs to be able to be drawn with one swish of a pen. Um, it can't. You can't leave the page at any time. Um, and there are also a few other uh, difficulties with this now. If we were to take our a and our b values so far apart that a cubic function can do its whole shebang in that interval, then we'll see that we've got three roots here, um, whereas we're only maybe suspecting there might be one root. So you've got to make sure your a and b um, input values, your interval, remember is 1.4 to 1.5 earlier, that's good, that's quite a small interval, but in this case here, this looks like a quite wide interval. Same thing here if you've got a x squared type graph, if your interval is too big, um, then you won't be able to spot the root, especially if it just comes up and touches and then goes back down, you, this theorem is never going to work. OK. And as well, if you've got a discontinuous function here, like the 1 over x graph here, you're not going to have a root here, but you're going to see a change in sign. Um, so you're going to you're going to think that there's a change in sign where there actually isn't. So you can think there's a root, but there actually isn't. OK, so there are some examples where it doesn't work. You're probably going to be given an example where it does work, but you may have to explain why it doesn't work for some equations. OK, we have a function here. It's quite a complicated cubic function. 54x cubed minus 225x squared plus 309x minus 104. And a student observes that f of 1.1 and f of 1.6 are both negative and states that f of x has no roots in the interval from 1.4 to 1.6. Explain, referring to the diagram, why the student is incorrect. Well, just from looking at the graph here, 1.1 seems to happen at about here, and 1.6 seems to happen at about here. And you can see here that both of the outputs at these points here are probably going to be both negative. So there is no change in sign, although there could be no roots, it's possible that there are either 2, 4, 6, or an even number of roots. From the diagram, uh, since the graph crosses the axis three times, it is possible that there are actually two roots in the given interval. Okay, so just explaining that it could have gone um, through the zero axis, through the zero coordinate, and back through the zero coordinate, so it's difficult to say um, whether it has a root there or not. The next part of the question asks us to calculate f of 1.3, 1.5 and 1.7 and use it to explain our answers there is, that there are at least three roots in between 1.1 to 1.7. 
So here we go, we've got f of 1.1, f of 1.3, f of 1.5, f of 1.7. We have a change in sign here, so that's one root. We have a change in sign here, so that's one more root. And then we have a change of sign in between here and here, so that is another root. So we have three um, places in which we have a change of sign, so therefore we have three intervals. Okay. Right then, a slightly more complicated question here, something more like what you're going to be facing. Using the same axis, sketch the graphs of y equals ln x and y equals 1 over x. Explain how your diagram shows that the function ln x minus 1 over x has only one root. So that's the 1 over x graph, that's the ln graph. Now how can we explain that this function here has only one root? Well, a root is found if we set the two equations equal to each other from our graphs. And we can rearrange the uh, graphs being equated equal to each other by subtracting the 1 over x onto the other side. Therefore, ln of x minus 1 over x equals 0 will only have one intersection, will only have one solution. Okay, so the roots of an equation are equal to 0, so the roots of the equation will be where the graphs cross, and we can see that they cross in only one place. Okay, so the number of times two graphs cross over will be the same amount of roots that one of that one of those graphs subtracts the other one of those graphs uh, has to equaling zero. Part B is show that there is a root in between 1.7 to 1.8. So taking your function, uh, substituting in 1.7 and substituting 1.8, we clearly see we have a negative to positive sign change here. So therefore we have a root in between 1.7 to 1.8. But we have to conclude that as well. We have to write a sentence saying that since the function is continuous across 1.7 to 1.8, there is a sign change and the root must be within this interval. Okay. Uh, part C is a typically a question where students um, accidentally go wrong. They're not quite sure what to do at this stage here. Given that a root f of x equals alpha, show that alpha is equal to, um, so a root f of alpha equals zero, that should rather say, show that alpha is equal to 1.753, correct to three decimal places. Now what you have to consider here is what is the interval? If we have 1.753, what would the upper bound and what would the lower bound be if this number has been rounded to three decimal places? So, the lower bound of this number here is going to be 1.7525. This will be the lower bound. And 1.7535 will be the upper bound. Now, it doesn't... Yes, I understand that 1.7535 will round to 1.754 when it's rounded to three decimal, uh, three decimal places, but that doesn't matter. I'm not saying that it could be equal to this. I'm just saying it has to be less than this. So this is these two numbers here are going to be the numbers that we're going to be substituting in now to, and show a sign change between those two. Effectively, we're saying that the root lies in this region here, in between 1.7525 and 1.7535. And we need to basically show then that there is a change in sign between these two numbers. So let's go ahead and do that then. And we can clearly see here we have a sign change from negative to positive. So therefore, since the function is continuous across the range from 1.7525 to 1.7535, there is a change of sign. Uh, the root must be within this interval. So it is therefore correct to round this root to 1.753 to three decimal places. Right then, your turn to have a go at this question here then. Pause the video and try this question out. Right, okay, so hopefully you've noticed that your calculator has to be in radians mode here. If your calculator was in degrees mode for this question, you'll have been getting some funny answers where you probably haven't seen a sign change. Um, so make sure you just uh, read the question. And generally with these types of questions, it's going to be in radians mode. <clears throat> so 
the first thing we're going to have to do is show a sign change in between uh, 1.4 to 1.5. So minus cos, I'm just typing this all into my calculator now, minus 1. I get out an answer of minus 0 0.0513, rounded to three significant figures, and 1.5 if I now just use my arrow buttons to go ahead and change those input values, I get 0 0.073, uh, well it would be four zero to three significant figures. Okay, so uh, now we need to write our conclusions. So as there is a change of sign in the interval um, 1.4 to 1.5 and f x is continuous there must be a root in the interval from 1.4 to 1.5. And there we are, it's a little bit of a pain to write that out, but it gets you the mark, you don't really have to do much brain work for it, so it's not too bad really. Uh, part B, show by choosing a suitable interval, show that alpha equals 1.441 to three decimal places. So I'm going to have to use a suitable interval for this. Now the upper bounds and the lower bounds here is going to be 1.4405. That will round this number here to three decimal places. And the upper bound is going to be 1.44. 1, 5, not 1.4415 1, exactly, but anything less than it is absolutely fine. We could put an equality on this one as well. So these, this is the interval I'm going to work out my um, function in between. So the first one, 1.4405, and I need to substitute that into both of the positions. So 1.4405. Gosh, oh, okay, I'm getting a number in standard form here. So I'm, gonna get in, I'm getting minus 5.54 dot, 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 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, you can see, as long as it's negative, that's all we're really interested in. So I'm not really interested in what this number is. I'm happy to write that down if, uh, if that makes life easy for everyone. Um, you could also turn it into a decimal using your knowledge of standard form. It's going to be minus 0 0.000554. You can see here that we'd have to jump the decimal point back once, twice, three times, four times to get it into the position that it was here. So there's only three zeros after the decimal point. Uh, if I replace now the zero in my calculation with a one, that's in the number that I'm substituting in, I get 6.988 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, yes, it's a decimal number, but uh, all I'm interested in is whether it's positive or negative. And in this case here, it is positive. So we're going to have to basically now write a similar conclusion, but not quite. We're going to have to add in the fact that um, it's in between this interval. Therefore, that value alpha is going to round to 1.441 to three decimal places, so let's go. So as there is a change in sign between 1.4415 and 1.4405, there is a root in the interval from 1.4405, and I'd ideally write this on the same line, but I'm going to have to move down to the next one, 1.4415, um, which will 
round to 1.44123 dp. Okay, there we are. So that's the answer to that question there then. So make sure you do write these conclusions at the end. Yes, they take a little bit of time, but hopefully not less than a minute, which is the ratio of marks to minutes you're hoping to aim towards. Maybe 30 seconds, so you it's energy efficient to get this mark rather than not to get this mark. Okay, well, have a plenty of practice on page uh, 276, exercise 10a. Make sure these questions aren't too difficult. We do really want you to be on autopilot when these sorts of questions come up. You know exactly what to do, no brain work required, and you can move on to the harder questions once you've finished these ones. So have some practice, um, make sure you're, you're efficient and quick at doing these questions here. They're not too challenging. Thanks very much for watching.